1999, a phenomenal event occurred in the skies which altered the course of human history. It's always either be eaten on the battlefield, no matter who or what you're up against. I have only spared you from total dissolution. The aliens have taken hostages and are controlling their bodies. Listen, Ulala, we're taking off by Astro Beat spaceship right now. Roger. It is rumored amongst the most intelligent races of Norath that first came the dragons. The great crystalline dragon, ruler over the plain of Sky, deposited life onto a lifeless planet, and with one swipe of her mighty claws, laid claim to the promise of a new world. Norath quickly developed from infancy as brave explorers journeyed forth in search of fertile lands on which to build. Villages became towns. Towns became cities. Cities became kingdoms. Massively multiplayer online role-playing games have been bringing PC gamers of all backgrounds together for decades. The most popular MMORPGs by the end of 2023 were games that began life in the 2010s and even the 2000s, some having more rocky starts than others. But through the dedication of the fan bases of these games and the devs who continue to breathe life into these games through expansion packs, MMORPGs have seen the kind of life and replay value that cannot be replicated in a lot of other game genres out there. One of those MMORPGs began life in March 1999 and has seen 30 expansions over the course of the past 25 years, EverQuest. But MMORPGs go back much further than that. Before massively multiplayer online role-playing games, there were multi-user dungeons. The earliest commercial MUD was the 1985 Island of Kesmai, a game developed for and played on the CompuServe online service for up to 100 people at a time for $6 an hour. One of the earliest examples of a game that relied on Commodore 64's online server, Quantum Link, was the LucasArts 1986 Habitat. Habitat was one of the first to take the concept of an online game beyond text-based adventures and multiple dungeons. Habitat's innovations were recognized in 2001 at the International Game Developers Association when devs Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar were the first ever recipients of the Pioneer Award, then known as the First Penguin Award. Habitat's accomplishments served as a precursor to how games can successfully bring people together from different parts of the country. Games throughout the 80s and 90s continued to rely on online servers to bring people together. These games were limited by the regulations of the National Science Foundation Network, the earliest set of guidelines established by the United States government to test the waters of communication between multiple networks in different parts of the country. The foundation was decommissioned in 1995 after network communication advanced enough to where online servers weren't necessary, paving way for the beginning of the internet, paving way for even more people to play games together. In 1996, Meridian 59 was released, making it the first online game to be played in a full 3D environment. The game itself didn't take off like online games to come, but it did show potential in the medium, and it continues to be supported to this day. The game was developed by Archetype Interactive. One of the leaders of Archetype Interactive was a young John Hank, who would go on to be the founder of Niantic Incorporated, developers of mobile augmented reality games like Ingress and Pokemon Go. In 1997, the term Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Game was coined by Richard Garriott, creator of the Ultima franchise, as a way to describe Ultima Online, a game that would completely change the perception of online gaming when compared to the games that were played on online servers prior to 1995. For years, Ultima Online became the standard for online role-playing games. 
different games were released, but could not achieve the short-term and long-term success that Ultima Online had achieved. But one game would eventually rival the popularity of Ultima Online, and that game would ironically be inspired by Ultima as a whole. Brad McQuaid and Steve Clover were such fans of Ultima, specifically Ultima 2 The Revenge of the Enchantress, that they wanted to create their own epic role-playing computer game in the same style as a Richard Garriott RPG. Their first game released on the Amiga would be the 1993 War Wizard. They attempted to make a sequel to the game, but could not find anyone to help finance and publish it. They did get some assistance in the form of art students Bill Trost and Kevin Burns. After months of trying to get their work in progress demo noticed, the demo would eventually be discovered by John Smedley of Sony Interactive Studios America. Smedley was intrigued by the demo of War Wizard's sequel and saw potential for something even better. Something that aligned with his own dreams of producing a large online game for the PC. But instead of being inspired by Ultima, Smedley was inspired by Simutronics' Cyber Strike, a 16-person mech combat game that was given an online Game of the Year award by Computer Gaming World in 1993. With Smedley's position at Sony and the capabilities of McQuaid and Clover, there was definitely going to be a new interpretation of an online game set in a large world, with Trost being the lead game designer. Their ideas would evolve into what was described by Trost as a game combining the MUD experience with the kind of 3D graphics that had been popularized throughout the 32-bit era of console gaming. The only problem with that was that McQuaid and Clover had no experience creating a 3D game. They tried to recruit people who had experience with 3D online games, but those attempts to reach out were met with laughter. No one in the industry believed that a large online game could work in a fully third-dimensional world. No one outside of the devs themselves took it seriously. There was concern that Smedley's bosses would shut the project down. Smedley was able to keep the work in progress a secret, as he felt that the less people who knew about the game, the more opportunities the team would have to actually finish the game. The EverQuest team was able to recruit another artist who, like Trost, believed in the vision of Smedley, McQuaid, and Clover, Rosie Rappaport. Between Trost and Rappaport, their own personal experiences with Dungeons & Dragons would help create the entire lore and aesthetics of EverQuest. Trost took characters he made in the D&D campaigns he participated in and integrated them into EverQuest, like Mayong Mistmore, the elf who was cursed to be the first vampire in the land of Norath. Rappaport, on the other hand, wanted to create a fantasy world that was different than what many fantasy stories were presenting. Her approach to the world building was more lighthearted and whimsical. I didn't want anything to be gray because at the time, role-playing games were brown and gray. Everything was wood and stone. I wanted everything to have more color and personality because color is another voice that creates a story. Trost and Rappaport were able to bounce ideas off of each other, like the idea of the Big Seas being inspired by the music video of No Rain by Blind Melon. In the spring of 1998, the EverQuest team went through a significant good news, bad news period. The good news was that the game was demoed at the Game Developers Conference to moderate success, and the opportunity for McQuaid and Clover to meet their idol, Richard Garriott, who even played the demo of EverQuest for them. The bad news for the dev team was that Sony of Japan's higher-ups found out about EverQuest. This was also during the period where Sony Interactive Studios America became 989 Studios, which was intended to be mostly known for its sports games. 989 Studios being attached to an online fantasy role-playing game for the PC didn't sit well with Sony. However, too much money had already been poured into the game, so they weren't about to shut the project down. But at the same time, Sony would no longer give the devs any more money for it, and the team would need to find a new company to help finance their efforts. Smedley refused to give up and shopped around for a new consortium. Luckily, he didn't have to go far to find new support for EverQuest. Sony Online Entertainment, a company that was geared towards the evolving online gaming market the same way Sony Computer Entertainment was geared towards the evolving console gaming market. 
Smedley McQuaid, Clover Trost Rappaport, and over 50 members of 989 Studios would join Sony Online Entertainment as a brand new developer studio, Veron Interactive. With new corporate backing, EverQuest avoided cancellation and was on track for launch without any fear of having to keep any of the development a secret. It is the adventure of Quest that awaits the bold and daring. It is the land of EverQuest. EverQuest launched in March 1999. By this time, Ultima Online was still the dominant online role-playing game, but despite the reluctance on the part of Sony, the hype for EverQuest was strong, becoming the most pre-ordered game of the year at EB Games, and on its first day, 10,000 accounts were made. It was more than what the devs were expecting. It took multiple employees with no experience for large online games to manually keep the servers running whenever they crashed due to higher than expected logins. Six months later, over 225,000 units were sold and the number of active players was up to 150,000. By the end of 1999, EverQuest would become the biggest online role-playing game on the PC, receiving Game of the Year accolades and multiple mentions in various best of lists. EverQuest would be supported by yearly expansions, and Sony marketing would push the game once they realized how big the game had gotten. Sony would end up acquiring Verant Interactive, citing how quickly the online gaming market had grown. Smedley would remain in charge of the studio upon returning to the company that once looked down at him and the rest of the EverQuest team, and scoffed at their chances of success. Eventually, the momentum of EverQuest would stall, and in 2004, EverQuest would be overtaken by World of Warcraft. But EverQuest's servers would last through World of Warcraft's success, and would also remain online in the wake of the popularity of Final Fantasy XIV. In 2015, Sony would sell all assets of Sony Online Entertainment to Columbus Nova of New York, and rebrand Sony Online Entertainment as Daybreak Game Company. That same year, following the acquisition, and following a year of dealing with threats from Lizard Squad, John Smedley would leave the company to start a new game studio under Amazon. Brad McQuaid would also leave Sony in 2013 to start a new company that would develop what he would consider a spiritual successor to the original EverQuest. The studio would be Visionary Realms, and the game would be Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. Sadly, in 2019, McQuaid would pass away from unspecified causes. McQuaid's partner, Steve Clover, would join the Pantheon team in 2022. The game, as of this video, is in pre-alpha testing. Bill Tross would join Intrepid Studios, currently working on the game Ashes of Creation. Rosie Rappaport would join Amazon Games, with her latest contribution being the environmental art lead for the game New World. EverQuest continues to be highly regarded as one of the most important online games, despite the rising popularity of other online games. The fanbase is even dedicated enough to create a replica of how EverQuest was played in its first years, Project 1999, originally released in October 2009. In April 2015, Project 1999 was recognized by Daybreak Game Company as a fan project with their full support and consent to continue offering Project 1999 to EverQuest fans, giving them the option to experience the game in its current state or during the years it dominated the online market. Online games have evolved drastically over the decades, from multi-user dungeons to massively multiplayer online role-playing games, from Habitat to Ultima Online. The way people could interact with one another saw a gigantic leap in gameplay, technology, and social interaction between the 80s and 90s. Then EverQuest came along and laid the groundwork for what a successful MMORPG would be going into the 21st century. The team would branch off into other areas of online role-playing gaming territory, but no matter what came out after 1999, and no matter what is currently in the works, the groundwork behind these games can almost certainly be rooted into the one game that dared combine traditional multi-user dungeon gameplay with 3D worlds.
me and you, and you and me. No matter how they toss the dice, it had to be the only one for me is you. Something's gone wrong in the happy-go-lucky world of Nintendo. Introducing Super Smash Brothers, where all your favorite characters go toe-to-toe -to -toe in one four-player star-studded slam fest, only on Nintendo 64. Rehearsal for Get Out the Vote promo, take one. Hi, America. Hi, boys and girls. It's me, Tiny Tank. Cue the theme song. Tinky, tinky, clinky, clanky, new from Centrax, Tiny Tank, America's lovable... Wait, 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 wait. Is that my theme song? Well, it hasn't been finalized yet. Wanky, wanky, tinky, tinky, what the f*** is that? You're being difficult. You're being an... I got a positronic brain. Oh, there, there, what you just did. That's the spirit we want. Who? A Centrax. It wants funding for a robot army. Ooh. To replace humans in wars. Ah, and I'm the cute little mascot. To get people to vote yes. Can I change my name at least? To what? Mechanicor, Tank of Doom? From the top, Tiny. Tiny Tank is my slave name. Oh, please. Vote promo, take two. Tiny? Tiny's not here. I am Mechanicor, Tank of Doom. Look, Tiny, you're cute. And you're a killing machine. What's wrong with that? It's creepy. It's not creepy. It's cute. It's uh, cute. A cute killing machine? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I got an 80 millimeter cannon for a nose. Hey kids, is this cute? Oops. Okay, we'll wrap for the day. Get another camera. Try again tomorrow. You okay, Fred? I'm all right. A props? Blanks for the tank next time? Alongside me, the professor, Matt Vaskersian. Up ahead, plenty of MLB 2000 action. In Boston, we'll see Kenny Loft and Rob Garcia Perra worse than the IRS. You want receipts? I got receipts. In Cincinnati, Greg Maddox, ninth inning, sit down and shut up. In New York, Jorge Posada finds out what it feels like to be an unlucky animal taking a dirt nap on the Jersey Turnpike. These highlights, plus Travis Lee, A Rod, and the Rocket coming right up.
want to know what it's like to be Tarzan? Then you'll love Tarzan on PlayStation. Outrun wild animals, surf on trees, and go one-on-one -on -one with a deadly hunter. Donkey Kong 64, composed by Grant Kirkhope. After you get your logos, reminding you of who made this game, you get one of the most polarizing vocal pieces in 90s gaming. The DK Rap, composed by Kirkhope and performed by George Andreas and Chris Sutherland, immediately introduces you to a soundtrack that uses fun and humor to enhance the gaming experience, which is what Kirkhope had already achieved with Banjo-Kazooie. Kirkhope viewed the DK Rap as something he did as a joke due to how popular the rap genre had become in the 90s. After the successful soundtrack to Banjo-Kazooie, Kirkhope brought more of that dynamic, humorous, fun music to this game. It completely replaces the more atmospheric soundtracks from David Wise that made Rare's Donkey Kong franchise such a standout. But to be fair, Kirkhope had far more experience with Rare games on the Nintendo 64 than Wise did, and Rare's platformers at the time didn't take itself too seriously. So Kirkhope's style of music was just as good of a fit for Donkey Kong's jump to the Nintendo 64 as he was with Banjo-Kazooie. Donkey Kong 64 also enhances the traditions of platformer games of the Nintendo 64 era by adding many more different items to collect, some of which could only be collected by one of five playable characters. This was either viewed as a great thing or a bad thing. Nintendo 64 platform games were notable for requiring players to collect various items to progress through the game. But with Donkey Kong 64, that formula started to feel more like a chore to some, thus resulting in some gamers' eyes as the game that made collect-a-thon style gameplay less popular. It also didn't help that this was the first Nintendo 64 game to require the expansion pack, due to what programmer Chris Marlowe described as a measure to prevent the game from crashing unexpectedly. This requirement, on top of the collect-a-thon style gameplay, resulted in Donkey Kong 64 being one of Rare's most polarizing titles. Regardless of how the gameplay of Donkey Kong 64 was viewed, and how much memory was required for the game to run properly, Donkey Kong 64 was still highly regarded for its music, even with the DK rap. Kirkhope's Nintendo 64 resume continued to build. From GoldenEye to this game, Kirkhope was responsible for many of Nintendo 64's most memorable soundtracks, and he still had more to offer the system even after the release of this game. Is it my imagination? Are we going like one mile an hour? What's going on here? Oi! Geezer! What? Our flight's in ten minutes! Well, we better hurry then, didn't we? <laughs> buckle up, boys! Buckle up! Come on, oh, mate! So, let's face the facts. I'm hot, you're hot. Who wants to pet me? Crash Team Racing. Once he gets behind the wheel, things get ugly. You and me. Booyah! Grandma. Booyah! <laughs> What's up, Knuckles? Whoa! Something bugging you? No time for games, Sonic. Give me the emeralds you have, right now! What? Let's just see you take them. Huh. Oh, no. Oh no! Give it your best shot! Oh no!
Uh, oh. oh no! The Chaos Emeralds! <laughs> ah, Eggman! Oh! Ha! Like taking candy from a baby! That's a Chaos Emerald! That's right, fool! You made it all too easy! You practically gave them to me! Hold it right there, creep! You can't get away with this! Knuckles, don't tell me Eggman tricked you again! Me? What about you? Way to go, Knucklehead! Now, I have four lovely emeralds! Chaos! These are for you, my friend! Ah! Oh, he transformed again! Man! No one ever cuts us any slack! King Masterpiece, the Egg Carrier! But it pales in comparison to the power of chaos! Adieu! Until we meet again, my friends! <laughs> We 
can't let him get away! Let's get to my workshop and we'll take the tornado! Yeah! You guys go! I have some unfinished business to take care of. No problem, Knuckles! We'll take care of everything here! Come on! Let's get going! Cain is deified. The clans tell tales of him. Few know the truth. He was mortal once, as were we all. However, his contempt for humanity drove him to create me and my brethren. I am Raziel, firstborn of his lieutenants.